If you start a ketogenic diet or begin therapeutic nutritional ketosis to treat bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, or another psychiatric illness, it's important to consider how to manage your medications. We get asked about this frequently, so in this video, we hope to dive into the topic further to better understand how providers and patients think about tapering medications in general, and then specifically how they think about it for people using nutritional ketosis to treat their psychiatric symptoms. That's one of our goals at Metabolic Mind, to, to educate and inform people about all things relating to metabolic psychiatry. Well, not providing specific medical advice, right? Uh, but before we dive in, let's get one thing straight right away. We're not advocating that people stop or taper their medications. We're stressing the importance of working closely with a prescribing physician when discussing medication changes because every person is different and, and tapering strategies must be tailored to each specific individual according to their goals, uh, their response over time to adjustments in both lifestyle and medication levels and, and what medications they're on and where they're starting from and a lot of different things. So, so let's get into the details about managing psychiatric medications when on a ketogenic diet. One important point is that whether you're on a ketogenic diet or not, many psychiatrists will follow the principle that they want to use the least number and the lowest dose of medications required to manage symptoms. So psychiatrists in that way are all trained in tapering medications, as you'll hear from Dr. Reed. So, so much of the information shared in this video is relevant to tapering strategies in general, not just specific to those employing nutritional ketosis as an intervention. But first a reminder, Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, exploring the intersection of metabolic and mental health and metabolic therapy therapies like nutritional ketosis as treatment for mental illness. Our channel is for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a provider-patient relationship. Many of the interventions we discuss can have dramatic or even potentially dangerous effects if done without proper supervision. Consult your healthcare provider before changing your lifestyle or your medications. We know from individual and group case studies, for example, one in France, that patients are reporting being able to slowly reduce medications once they're stable with nutritional ketosis. In the French study, 64% of the participants left the treatment on less medication. Now, we don't have randomized controlled trials to guide us, but because tapering medications is always based on each individual, and many factors come into play, the same principles apply whether a person is in nutritional ketosis or not. Many individuals find that the side effects of psychiatric medications, especially at high doses, can be problematic. So one reason to go on a ketogenic diet is to see if by stabilizing the brain with nutritional ketosis, individuals might be able to slowly reduce the number and dose of medications needed. But how do you know if it's safe to try tapering and how do you determine a specific tapering program? How can you tell the difference between a withdrawal effect and a symptom of your disorder? We are joined by two experts on this topic, Dr. Georgia Ede, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist with decades of clinical experience, and Matt Bazuki, an individual with lived experience who knows firsthand what it's like to work with his providers to slowly and safely taper his medications. Both Matt and Dr. Ede agree on a few important principles. Work closely with your medication prescriber, taper one medication at a time, it's unsafe to go off a psychiatric medication cold turkey. Slower is better, even if it takes weeks, months, or even years to reduce or eliminate a medication. So first, let's hear from Dr. Ede. So Dr. Ede, when you hear someone say they want to get off their psychiatric medications, what do you think? What goes through your mind as a clinician? Uh, do you mean in the context of being on a ketogenic diet or the reason what the, the, that's why they want to try a ketogenic diet is to go off medications? Right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So someone says, I'm going to start a ketogenic diet so that I can get off my, my medications for my mental illness, whether it's bipolar disorder, severe depression, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera. Yeah. So, so first of all, I think it's a, it's a wonderful goal and it's a wonderful goal to use the least amount of medication possible. That's, I think that's the goal, whether you're on a ketogenic diet or not. And, you know, practicing psychiatry for so many years, even before I started using ketogenic diets in my practice, my goal was always to use the least amount of medication that a person needed to, to be well and stable. So if you want to try a ketogenic diet in hopes of, of using less medication or perhaps even going completely off your medication, uh, that is also a wonderful goal. And sometimes that is possible. Uh, you know, some people are able to, to eventually completely taper off all of their psychiatric medication. 
Some people are able to reduce the number of medications they're taking or the dosages of the medications they're taking. And some people are, are able to use a ketogenic diet instead of medication. So if you haven't already started a medication, sometimes starting a ketogenic diet can allow you to avoid needing to take psychiatric medications in the first place. However, <laughs> there are lots of people, uh, including in my own practice, who start a ketogenic diet, they feel a lot better, uh, they feel a lot better physically and emotionally, but they are not able to taper off uh, their psychiatric medications. It's still a major victory, though, for, for most of them, because the, 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 the diet itself is a really healthy metabolic intervention and can really help counteract the side effects, a lot of the common side effects of psychiatric medication. And so there, there are different outcomes there's no, I, I can't tell you, you know, so if, if someone comes to me and says, will I be able to come off my psychiatric medication? I'll say, well, I don't know. You know, this will be a process of discovery and we'll find out what's possible for you. But there are, there are lots of wonderful possibilities. Um, and uh, in most cases, people are happy with the outcome, but it may not be always that it's completely coming off every psychiatric medication. Yeah, I really like how you laid that out. That first and foremost, no matter what approach, you're trying to get them on the least amount of medications for the effect that they need to have, whether that's with a ketogenic diet or without. So I really like how you laid that out from the start. But also that even if you can't reduce your medications, it doesn't mean that the, you know using nutritional ketosis is a failure or isn't working because it can still help them with the side effects or help them even feel better even on the same amount of medication. So I really like how you laid that out. Now, but what about the the timing of thinking about reducing medications? Because when we talk about mental illness, it's not one thing, right? You could be hospitalized with psychosis and mania or severe depression, or you could be in a relatively stable period at home or anything in between. So when you when when you talk to somebody about the timing of when they might want to consider or when they might not want to consider reducing medications, what are some of the general guidelines that you advise? Yeah, so here is where things get pretty um, specific to the individual. <laughs> so let me just say, generally speaking, that if all is going well and the person has transitioned well to the ketogenic diet, has tolerated the diet well, they're feeling good, that, and, and I haven't seen any problems uh, come up uh, in terms of the combination of the diet plus the medication, which is something we can talk about later. But let's say everything's gone smoothly. The earliest time frame that I like to begin looking at uh, potentially reducing one of the medications uh, is, you know, six to 12 weeks after they have uh, been on the ketogenic diet. And the, the earliest, at least in the epilepsy literature, uh, uh, is usually four weeks in. I like to wait at least six weeks. And I think ideally, I like to wait 12 weeks. And the reason for that is that at 12 weeks, not only are you more likely to be looking at a new equilibrium, that your, your body and your mind is, is, is really in a solidly new place, different from where it was before metabolically, uh, chemically. Uh, so you're more likely to be looking at a new kind of stable equilibrium, but you're also more likely to be comfortable with the diet and you've gotten some practice with the diet and you've had a chance to decide whether it's a diet that you want, that you think you want to stay with longer term. Because if you're just kind of experimenting with the diet and you're kind of going on and going off, uh, once you start making medication changes, you know, you really, it, it's really kind of a, you want to be in a place where you're feeling more committed to, to staying on the diet longer term, because otherwise you're going to be going back and forth with your prescriber saying, oh, I went off the diet. Do I need to raise the medication again? You know, so I like to wait at least 12 weeks. That's in an ideal and smooth situation, but there are lots of things that can come up as you're going along that might make it reasonable and sometimes even necessary to reduce the medications earlier. And that's why it's so important to work <laughs> to work with your prescriber when you're doing this because you can sometimes see medications can start to feel uncomfortable in combination with the diet and might need to be reduced or the level of the medication might change in combination with the diet. Uh, so, you know, side effects can come up. So sometimes the medications need to be adjusted 
earlier than that. But if everything's going smoothly, I like to wait. I like personally like to wait 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah, I like the way you said that, that they have they should be stable and committed to it because in a way it's like another medication. And if you just stop taking your medication, well, it's the same as just stopping your diet because you come out of ketosis, which changes your body's physiology. So I, I really like the way you said that. I don't think it's something people necessarily think of like, Oh, I could just start ketogenic diet and I can taper my medicines without really thinking through, am I going to be on this long term to help me stay off? or stay on lower doses of medication. So I think that was well said. Now, and you talk about how there are lots of specifics with the medication. Some you need to taper sooner, um, some you need to be more concerned of. So I know none of this is is individual medical advice and none of this is meant for someone to take and do on their own, right. um, but rather to discuss with their clinician. But are there medications where you think, okay, these are sort of the first ones I want to get people off of. And these are the ones I want to save till later and be the last ones to get off of. So is there, on either end of their spectrum, are there medications that fit those buckets for you? No, and here's why. So, uh, the, but the, there are specific questions you can ask yourself and, and that you can work with your clinician to, to answer. Um, there's no one correct order in which to approach medication tapering. And the reason is this. So, so most people, unfortunately, fortunately, for better or for worse, are taking more than one psychiatric medication. So if there were just one involved, then of course, that would be the one that you would start to taper when you felt ready to do so. But most people are taking more than one. And that's where this question comes in, which where do we begin? And it really depends on several things that are specific to that individual. So let's say that you are taking, let's say, Brett, you come to me and you're taking an antidepressant and you're taking an antipsychotic and you're taking an anti-anxiety medication. So regardless of what the names of them are, it doesn't even matter. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about those medications so that you and I can decide together which one are we going to, to start working on first. So I'm going to ask you, which one of these medicines do you do you wish you could stop first? Like, what, is the is one of these bothering you a lot? Are you having a lot of side effects with one of these? Like, what's your wish list? If you could just pick one, which one would you want to stop? But that's not the only important thing. That's important, but not the only important thing. Another important thing is when you look at these medications, these three medications that you're taking. Can you tell me what those medications have done for you? So. Are, is there any one of these medicines that you view as particularly important to, to your well-being? Is there one of these medicines, did one of these medicines help keep you out of the hospital? Did one of these medicines, you know, help keep you from harming yourself? Like, do you view one or more of these medicines as being particularly crucial to your well-being? That's the one we're going to taper last, <laughs> So, if you see what I mean. So, um, and, and the third uh, consideration is, which one of these medicines is, is the easiest one to taper? Some you can taper more quickly than others, and some are, are more complicated. So let's say that you don't view any one of these medicines as particularly uh, crucial to your well-being. They've all been somewhat helpful. You don't have a favorite one that you want to stop first. And you say to me, well, Dr. Ed, you know, which one would you pick first? I'm going to pick the one that's easiest to taper first. So, um, so for example, if your antidepressant is Wellbutrin, well, butrin is a lot easier to taper than, say, Paxil, paroxetine, um, which can take, in some cases, weeks or even months to taper off comfortably and safely. So uh, why not go for the low-hanging fruit first if all of the things are created equal? Yeah. And, and you mentioned the timeline, um, weeks to months, depending. Um, so... This brings up the concept of how quickly can I get off my medications, right? Not just can I, but then the next question is how quickly. So what are some of your concerns of going too fast? And then I guess on the flip side, are there concerns with going too slow? Uh, no concerns with going too slow unless a medication is really giving you a lot of side effects. Um, so for example, if I'm working with somebody who's taking uh, a medication and they start the ketogenic diet and the medication starts to feel strong as though they're having a lot of side effects from it, I'm going to target that medication first. And I might even need to taper it a little bit more quickly than I otherwise would if I'm concerned about a serious side effect emerging. So again, that's why it's so important to work with somebody who really knows medications and who knows you. Um, so 
So sometimes that's necessary, but that's not that's not very common. But it happens enough to be worth mentioning. Um, the the uh, the other thing about timing is that each medication is a little bit different. So um, most psychiatric medications must be tapered slowly rather than stopped abruptly. You should never never stop any psychiatric medication abruptly, and never stop a psychiatric medication without talking to the clinician who's prescribing that medication for you. And that's not just you know some legal disclaimer that I'm just saying to be generically um, uh, safe or, or legally protect myself. It's for your safety. Because tapering medications, in some cases, if you go too fast, um, can cause either extremely uncomfortable extremely uncomfortable side effects um, or can even be medically dangerous if you stop them too quickly. So a couple of examples. So if you're tapering, say, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, these are really common uh, medications prescribed for depression and anxiety. Uh, Say it's a medication like uh, Paxil or Zoloft. Those are both good examples of serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Lots and lots of people take medicines in that family, Selexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, et cetera. Um, you would think, well, that's just an antidepressant. You know, that, uh, that's, not, that's not a problem. I can just stop that. The problem with the serotonin medications is that when you, if, for, if you stop them abruptly, you can have really uncomfortable and sometimes uh, psychiatrically dangerous side effects uh, if you do that. So for example... You can experience things, uh, you know, like dizziness and headaches and nausea and uh, nightmares and sleeplessness and things like that. But you can also experience agitation, uh, depression, anxiety, and you can even experience these very strange symptoms uh, that are referred to as brain zaps. Uh, People have all kinds of very strange uh, physical and emotional side effects when they're trying to stop a medication uh, in the serotonin family too quickly. And you might say, well, how quickly is too quickly? It depends on the person. So some people can stop these medications within a few weeks. Others may take many months uh, and they have to go down extremely slowly in tiny increments. It's very individualized. So if you stop those medications abruptly, um, it can cause a lot of psychiatric distress. Um, now there are other medications. A good example would be the benzodiazepines, uh, medications. These are medications like Xanax and Ativan and Clonopin, uh, medicines. These are, these are medicines which are prescribed very commonly for anxiety and sleep. These medications, um, if you stop them too quickly, you can actually, there's a risk of having withdrawal seizures and all kinds of other really uncomfortable symptoms that can be life-threatening. You have a seizure when you're driving. If you have a seizure, you know uh, when you're climbing a ladder. This this is a very dangerous situation. So uh, it's very important to taper these medicines slowly. Um, in in a lot of cases, the slower the better. Again, as long as it's not causing you any side effects where we need to go faster, slower is always better. Small increments, wait long periods of time between each each uh, dosage drop. And really make sure that you're feeling solid before you take the next uh, take the next dosage um, down. So this is the kind of thing that honestly requires a lot of clinical experience with medications to be able to do comfortably with people. And so you really want to work with somebody who knows you and who knows medications well. Yeah, it sounds like it takes experience from the clinician standpoint and patience from the patient standpoint. Yes. <laughs> really ca- cannot be in a rush to do this. And and the risks of going too fast seem far greater than the risks of going too slow. Um, in, a, in our interview with Matt Pazuki, he talked about his difficulty um, weaning off his benzos yeah. and how it, it was very challenging and had to go very slow. Now, interesting, the other thing Matt brings up is the importance of monitoring his sleep. And since he specifically coming from a um, bipolar standpoint with bipolar one diagnosis, and he's been prone to mania, that monitoring his sleep was so important. And if he noticed that he was getting less sleep, which he was tracking vigilantly, he would know now is not the time to decrease more and actually may need to, to go back. So 
I use that as an example. So what advice do you give to people on what they should be monitoring in their own life to track for, you know, like some side effects are going to be very obvious and some are going to be a little more subtle. So to sort of pick up on the the subtle hints that maybe something is creeping up, what, what kind of advice can you give? Yeah. And so again, and I hate to sound uh, repetitive, but it really depends on the individual because for, for two, and the, the question you're asking is very, very important because it brings up how do you tell the difference when you're tapering a medication uh, between your old symptoms coming back because the medication dosage is now too low for you, so you need to back up and you need to stay on a certain amount of medication? And how do you tell when it's because you're going too fast or you're getting withdrawal effects? If you're tapering a medication and you start to feel uncomfortable, let's say, like for example, you know, you had mentioned that Matt followed his sleep really closely and when his sleep started to feel a little rougher, he knew you know, that, that that was a sign that he might you know, uh, be going too quickly with the medication or that might not be a good time to, to make another change. So that's a great example. But one of the, one of the, one of the most challenging things to do as a psychiatrist, whether, whether your patient is taking a, 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 whether your patient is on the ketogenic diet or not, is when you're trying to taper medication is to figure out, okay, we've just made a change in the medication person is feeling a little worse in some way, is that because we've gone too fast with the taper and we need to, you know, to, to, to slow it down? Are they having withdrawal symptoms from the medication or are their symptoms coming back? And this is a sign that they actually need to go back to that previous dose because that's the amount that they're going to need to feel well. And this really is, this is why all of this is so personalized and individualized is because having a lot of experience can help you figure that out. It's not foolproof, but having a lot of experience can help you tell the difference between what a withdrawal symptom is and what, uh, you know, and what is a sign that the medication may need to be continued. And, but, but, but the bottom line is if you're going very slowly and you're using just small increments, if you're, if you're lowering the medication in, uh, by just small amounts and you're really, really patient it's a lot easier to tell the difference. So because uh, first of all, um, if you're going very, very slowly, it's a lot less likely that you're suddenly going to see all your symptoms come back. It's much more likely if it's within two or three days of lowering that dose, it's almost always a withdrawal uh, side effect. So these are the kinds of things. And then you had asked, which types of things should you monitor? For example, Matt was monitoring his sleep. That again, depends on the person. What are your what what withdrawal symptoms are do we know about that particular medication? So, for example, if you are tapering a seizure medication, a lot of seizure medications, anticonvulsant medications are used in psychiatry, um, and benzodiazepines we talked about are often used in psychiatry. If you're taping a medicine like that, you're going to watch for withdrawal symptoms from those medications, which are very different than withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants. But we're also so going to we'll, we're going to monitor for specific withdrawal symptoms uh, that that are characteristic of each medication, but we're also going to watch the types of symptoms that you and your past uh, that that have been problematic for you in the past, because we're watching for two things: we're watching for withdrawal symptoms from the medication, but we're also watching for signs that your condition is worsening and that your uh, that some of the old symptoms that used to bother you before you started taking medication are those starting to come back? So this is why a personalized approach is so important. Yeah, I think you've done a very good job of of explaining why this is a difficult process, a doable but difficult and careful process that needs to be individualized and isn't a cookbook way to do it. So that brings up the question, though, of will physicians, will psychiatrists be able to do this with their patients? Now, are, I mean, I'm sure there are some psychiatrists who would rather take the approach of, nope, you're stable on your medications. I don't want you to reduce any doses. It's not worth the risk. So one, I mean, have you encountered psychiatrists or physicians like that? And two, what kind of advice could you give if someone experiences that with their clinician? It's a really common concern, and I can see both sides of it, honestly. I can I can see the patient's perspective where, let's say, they're feeling better on a ketogenic diet and they really want to begin tapering their medications. That's, of course, uh, I, I understand that and want to support them in that goal. But I can also see the psychiatrist's point of view where uh, tapering a medication, there's some risk involved, as I was just describing, 
it's time consuming. Uh, it's going to take more visits. It's going to take more, more time and energy. Psychiatrists, most of them are really busy. And so they might need, while, they're, while you're tapering a medication, they might need to see you uh, once a week for a while. They might hear from you on your messaging system or, you know, uh, they might call you or, or uh, send you messages a lot more frequently. And so if you're a busy clinician, that becomes something that, you know, why, you know, why would you want to, <laughs> why would you want to um, take the extra time to do that? And I think, you know, so I do understand both sides of it, but all psychiatrists uh, have experienced tapering psychiatric medications. It's part of what we do, mostly because prescribing medications, unfortunately, even in 2023, prescribing psychiatric medications is almost entirely a trial and error process. So when we're trying to find a medication that works for somebody, we are trying hopefully one at a time, very slowly and patiently to find something that helps. And every time we stumble upon something that doesn't help, which happens a lot, we have to taper that medicine off and start a new one. So we have a lot of experience <laughs> tapering psychiatric medications. And so I would, uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to have a conversation with the psychiatrist and say, you know, in, you know, based on my working with this particular person, I think they are in a really different place now. I, I think they're a lot healthier. Um, their symptoms seem to be a lot less physically and emotionally. I think this person's in a much better place. I think they're ready to try this. And uh, so I think, I think it's really worth, I think it's really worth uh, the time and energy. So I try, you know, and, um, uh, sort of come at it from that point of view, just uh, encouraging and supportive. Uh, but I also remind the patient that, um, you know, this is the ultimate decision about, about, what you decide to do, it really does rest with you. I mean, you need to have your psychiatrist or your nurse practitioners, your, your prescribing clinician, you need to have, you need to be working with somebody who wants to support you. So let's say you are working with a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner who doesn't have the time to help you taper the medication or doesn't think it's a good idea. You do have the option of looking for somebody else to work with um, who, who, who would support you. Although that can be really challenging. It can be really challenging to find somebody who takes your insurance or who has openings in their practice or who is willing to work with somebody who's on a ketogenic diet. So this is why, why I'm so delighted that the Metabolic Mind Organization exists because one of the things we're all working on together is to help more people learn about these strategies train clinicians, I train clinicians how to, how to, how to uh, work with ketogenic diets and medication management, um, you know, get information out to more people so that there'll be more and more clinicians who feel comfortable working with these strategies. And also we have a clinician directory now, small but growing uh, clinician directory where people can look for uh, prescribing professionals as well as, as well as other types of professionals who are, are keto savvy and, and willing to work uh, with you on these things. So we need many, many more clinicians who do this. Um, but I would say what's most important is to try to convince the clinician you're already working with of the reasons why you want to do this for your health, that you, you're, you're willing to work with them and be patient and follow their, follow their instructions about how to taper the medications and, uh, you know, that, that you really are trying, as I think all psychiatrists would agree is the best idea, you're trying to use the least amount of medication necessary. And hopefully they'll share that goal with you. Yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it is um, really commendable that you're, you have your CME course, that you are training clinicians how to use a ketogenic diet within metabolic psychiatry. But at the same time, a physician to help you taper your medications does not have to know about the ketogenic diet and how to use a ketogenic diet. And I like how you said everybody has experience, every psychiatrist has experience with tapering medications, so everybody can help you. So to, to go to diagnosisdiet.com um, slash directory to find someone who's taking your training course is a great place to find clinicians, but not necessary. There are other clinicians who should be able to help with the tapering, um, but 
to that, find that's one that's right. even because if you're if you're already stable on a ketogenic diet, if you've already if you've already gone through the transition phase, the keto adaptation phase, you've come to your new metabolic equilibrium and you're feeling well, any psychiatrist can help you taper your medications. They don't need to know anything about the ketogenic diet to do that. And that's a really good point. So um, nevertheless, <laughs> that's not the response that I usually get from psychiatrists. Um, they, you know, I think it's, I think there is a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of uh, hesitance uh, about working with somebody who is on a ketogenic diet uh, because there's not a lot of familiarity. And so it can feel, you know, it can feel uncomfortable as a clinician who doesn't have any experience or knowledge about these diets to work with somebody who might know something more about ketogenic diets than the clinician themselves do. And, and I, th I think that, that that's a fair point. But as you said, the person is already stable on a ketogenic diet. There's, you don't need any special knowledge about a ketogenic diet to taper a psychiatric medication. Very good. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and really sharing this information because this is such an important topic. And I can understand people wanting to get off their medications, but really could be a risky situation. So it, it's it's really measured and and authoritative and educated voices like yours that are, are are so necessary for people to understand that there is a safe way to do this and it needs to be done in conjunction with an experienced clinician to do it and people should not be doing this on their own and there there are real risks involved. Uh, so thank you so much for, for taking the time and giving us your knowledge and your experience. You're very welcome. Thanks for the great questions and I hope people found it helpful. You can hear from Dr. Ede's answers how this approach needs to be individualized. That's one of many reasons why we don't want you to think that just by watching this video, you're able to reduce your medications. Hopefully her answers kind of impressed upon you the importance of working with your prescribing physician, but also how just about every psychiatrist should have some level of comfort in helping their patients reduce medications safely when appropriate. I really appreciate her providing that realization. But next let's hear from Matt Bazuki about his personal journey and his on ongoing journey with his medication tapering. So Matt, we hear a lot of people who are taking medications, whether it's for depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, and they hope they can find a way to get off those medications or at least to reduce the dose. Now you have personally gone through this. And so I really, first, I want to thank you for taking the time to share your personal story and your personal journey with us. But I want you to sort of go back to the point where you first thought, maybe I can start to taper my medications. And what was that like? What was the motivation? What was the thought process like when you go back to that point? Mm. So I remember the the point when I realized I might be able to taper these was, um, I would say about 2018 when I had a moment of insight and I started to establish some healthy habits, exercising regularly and taking care of better care of my sleep, not perfect, but better. And what I realized was that some of those habits could serve as buffers where if they were in place and they were consistent, I might not need as much medication. So I was able to start to come off antipsychotic and the benzodiazepine I was on out of then. I ended up doing a cross taper over to Valium and then coming off that. And that was very challenging for me. Um, but I still needed medications. I still needed Zyprexa, the antipsychotic, to keep me from going manic, especially in March. So that was a pretty consistent thing. I still depended on medications especially Zyprexa and always Zyprexa to bring me back whenever I would start to go into some sort of hypomanic episode. I would start to sleep less and less every night for a period of nights, consecutive nights, three or four, and then I would take extra Zyprexa and I would have a long sleep. And this was happening consistently throughout 2018 and 2019 and into and even 2020. So I was coming off some of them and my parents and I, with the help of a psychiatrist, were playing around with different medications and we just couldn't find the right balance. And it seems like I, it seemed like I really, because I wasn't on keto at the time, I didn't go on keto until 2021. I just depended on the antipsychotics and the mood stabilizers to keep me from going into a hypomanic episode consistently and especially in March, but throughout the entire year. When I realized I could really taper these was when I went on keto, which was in the beginning of 2021. 
And I went through that march on a much lower dose of Zyprexa, five milligrams a day, which was about, you know, 25% of what I had been taking previously. And I realized that this might be possible. I was able to accelerate the benzo taper. I was able to get off the benzos that fall, which was in October of 2021. It was really challenging, but I managed to get off them. Um, I have no doubt that keto played a major part in my ability to get off them. And it was challenging and I'm still on a low dose of a few. I'm on a little cocktail of a few meds, but the doses are really low and the side effects are minimal. And the recent challenge has been getting off lithium, which has been going very well down from 1500 to 600. To answer your question, I think the when I really started to put the sleep hygiene and the exercise and some of the other kind of organic mood stabilizers into place and really take them seriously was when I realized I might be able to get off some of these. But it sounds like it was the it wasn't until the dietary approach really kicked in and you were in nutritional ketosis that you were able to sort of speed it up to a degree. So it is a super interesting journey how that happened. But I want to go back to what you said when you were when you were starting to come off the antipsychotic, the Zyprexa. It sounds like you needed to be very aware if you were starting to become hypomanic. Like you had to have great insight to that to say, I need to go back on. So how how did that come about? Was that from your psychiatrist? Was that from your family? Like what was the what was the way you could really stay connected to say, okay, something's happening here where I think I need to go back up on the medication? Mm, that's a great question. And you know, Brett, I've just been tracking my sleep for years. I track it every night. I have an aura ring, which is very good. And before I had the aura ring, I would just track when I fell asleep and when I woke up. And I would just look at the time I spent asleep and I would look at particularly, and I think for people with a bipolar one disorder, this might be especially useful. I would look at whether or not I had slept less than the night before. And if I saw two, three, four consecutive nights where I had slept less each night, I knew something was up. Because I was so meticulous about tracking my sleep, I was able to catch these hypomanic episodes, as it were, before they really escalated and before I lost insight. So for those couple of years when I wasn't on keto and I was to, relying on the medications to keep me stable, I was stable, still able to catch all of these episodes before they took me away. And I was very fortunate. And it was only because I kept track of my sleep in writing and I looked at that log consistently. And I knew that the only way I would be able to stay stable at the time because I didn't have keto, I didn't have that resource was to just watch for less and less sleep because yeah. nights. Such, such an important message. Cause I think a lot of people probably think in their brains like, Oh, these people have come off their medications. I can do it too. All I have to do is be smart about how I taper and that's it. But no, it's so much more involved. And you had that meticulous nature. You had that commitment to measuring your sleep, which was really so important. Um, so su such an important lesson that you still have to be vigilant and it's not a straight line. You go down a little, you go up a little, you go down a little, you go up a little. So as long as the trend is overall down, you're progressing, but it's not a straight line. And it sounds like your journey was like that as well. Mm -hmm. But then once you, you were in nutritional ketosis and you were able to, to withdraw or sorry, to taper the doses a little bit more effectively. Give us still a time frame. You know, you said you were you went down in, in lithium, you went down into Prexa, but over what time frame did you reduce like 50% of the dose or, you know, 75% of the dose because I want to get that concept of how long that took. It's a long process. It took me a long time. I had been coming off the benzos for a couple of years at that point and I was able to get off them in about 9 months. And I think I was down to a low dose of benzos in that. We just, I tapered them very, very slowly with a compound pharmacy tapering 0.1 milligram of diazepam per week or a couple times a week, whatever it was. So really, 0.1 really milligram, 0.1 milligram. I think I was doing 0.1 every week or 0.1 twice a week towards the end. So I decelerated the rate of the taper towards the end of the taper. So I was able to drop a milligram towards the beginning when I was on a high dose but then, you know, you take a milligram off 50 milligrams, that's 2%. You take a milligram off 10 milligrams, that's 10%. Suddenly you're tapering effectively five times as much. So the rate of the deceleration needs to be less. So I did it. I slowly slowed, 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 and I was eventually able to get off them. But the point is, this was a long, long journey. I, the Zyprexa, I was on five milligrams a day at the time, and it was my mission to come off 
of the five down to 2.5. And that took a long time as well. I think that took about, I want to say it took about seven or eight months to get from five to 2.5 milligrams. Again, compound pharmacy, 0.1 milligrams, you know, 0.1 milligram a week, six months. There you go. And so I'm on 2.5 now. Um, I So I, I did the Valium and then I did... I did the diazep or I did the, uh, excuse me, I did the Zyprexa 5 to 2.5 in 2022. And then in 2022, again, I started the lithium taper about six months ago, five months ago. And I've gone from 1500 down to 600 milligrams of lithium now, which is kind of crazy. It is remarkable the, how few uh, manic, I mean, this is March right now and I, I haven't seen anything. I'm watching very carefully, but I haven't seen it yet. So um, it's just, it's a really, really slow slow, careful process of doing one medication at a time, changing one variable at a time, doing them with the help of a psychiatrist, as well as keto, obviously. And, you know, I hope I hope by the time I'm 30, 31, I'll be off all of them. So which would be four or five years from now, but we'll see. I'm not in a rush because the side effects are relatively minimal now. Um, I'm also on a low dose of Quetro and Isratapine. They're very low. So it's a little cocktail, but the doses are low and side effects are minimal at this point. Yeah, I, that's, I mean, it's really impressive to hear how slow it is. And I think that'll surprise a lot of people. But I like what you're saying. Like, there's no rush. Like, what's the rush? Because you got to the point where the side effects are minimal. But, um, and I want to ask you about that. But first, I want to go back to what you said about tapering by percentage rather than dose. And I think that is mm. so important because we frequently will say you're on 50, go to 25. You're on 25, you know, go to go to 12. You're on 12, you can stop or what, you know, and that that's just too simplistic of a concept because the percentages probably make more of a difference. But not everybody's on board with that. So was that difficult to work with your psychiatrist to get that concept of going by percentage rather than by dose or or how that come about? My, especially my dad and I are very math oriented thinkers. So we really, we really plan this out. And I understood that, you know, just thinking about this logically taking and, and my experience as well, especially the benzos, which caused me horrific side effects when I was tapering off them. It was actually quite terrible, but I was able to take one milligram off of a 50 milligram dose of diazepam when I was on that. And but taking one milligram off of four or five milligrams is just impossible because you're you're basically taking 10 times as much relative to what you're on. So yeah, taking um, tapering by percentage rather than absolute um, amount of the medication. So rather than taper one milligram per week for one year to get off 50 milligrams, maybe I would taper you know, 3% per week or 2% per week, and then just do the math and calculate how much that would equate to. I, and my experience having tapered of quite a few medications is that the body responds to tapering a consistent percentage of the medication, or at least I'll say my body responds to it as though the taper is consistent. So tapering one milligram, one, one milligram, one milligram for six months, my body doesn't feel that that's a consistent um, withdrawal of the medication and a consistent taper. But if I taper 1%, it feels like, okay, the same amount of meds or the effect of the med on my system is lessening by the same amount every week. So I think it was so important for me to do that. So what's an example of a time that maybe you went a little too fast and your body let you know? What, 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 give us an example mm. of that. I think the Valium towards the end, I just remember there were a couple weeks where I said, maybe I'm on 10 milligrams diazepam. And I said, okay, I think we could try to drop it to nine this week or we could drop it to 9.5. And I would just have a terrible withdrawal, you know, really, really, really terrible withdrawal. And I had to learn the rate at which my body could handle these tapers, especially the benzo and the Zyprexa, which also caused me withdrawal. The lithium has not, but the, those two did. And I gradually learned through trial and error how much or what percent of these meds I could taper on a weekly basis 
and still kind of be okay. And it was impossible to prevent the withdrawals entirely. But there were many times where I just did a little too much and I would feel it. And then I would say, rather than go up, which I never did, I actually never went back up. I would just say, okay, for the next dose, we're either going to decrease the amount or we're going to wait a little longer to do it. So maybe we're going to wait two weeks instead of one week, or we're going to taper a 0.5 instead of a one. And so those are the two mechanisms by which I could decrease, effectively decrease the rate of the taper. Um, and it was just very slow progress and trial and error. And these, uh, these are really challenging meds to taper. Benzos are very, very challenging to get off. And, and this is a tangent, but it's very sad that the psychiatrists tend to put people on these like candy. Um, and, uh, and I was just so, I was just, especially the diazepam, the Valium taper, I was just humbled and I had to be very careful, but I eventually got off it. And I think keto can make it easier to taper some of these. Yeah. So how's your quality of life changed since you've been able to taper your medications? It's night and day. It's night and day. I remember the summer in 2016 when I was on 10, 15 milligrams as I practiced a 20 milligram something very high. I was on 20 when I was in the psych ward or more. And it's just not, it's not a life worth living. You know, the weight gain, the lethargy, the fatigue, the brain fog, um, I, I really couldn't live. I, I couldn't function. I couldn't do any of the things I like to do. I had no motivation to get outside, get active, but just kind of a flywheel of frustration because then I couldn't, you know, I couldn't improve on those in those elements as well. But my experience of life now, having gotten off some of these, not all the way off, but off them enough to the point where I can more or less live, is just. It's just next level. And I'm so excited to see what's going to happen when I eventually get off them because maybe I am still sedated to a certain extent and I don't realize it because it's been so long since I was entirely off medications. So relative to the high doses I was on, you know, 20 Zyprexa, 1500 lithium and other and all the other meds I've been on, this is like um, an amazing amazing experience of life. So I would encourage people out there to really give this a shot. And I just, but I did it under the supervision of a psychiatrist very slowly. I didn't go on keto in 2021. This, I think this is such an important point. I'm glad I had, I was working with intelligent people. I didn't go on keto in 2021 at the beginning of the year. And then three weeks later, expect to just drop all these medications. I really didn't. And I didn't do that. It's still been a very, very slow process, but I've been able to, I've been able to get off them. Yeah. So it sounds like you really hit the the right level because you improved your quality of life by getting, by diminishing the side effects without going so far that you wound up back in the hospital, wound up manic or psychotic or, or severely depressed as can happen if you go too fast. And you did that by, by being very meticulous about it and working with your, with your doctors. And, and I like sort of the, the advice that you give that it has to be a team approach, but also this comp, this concept of a compounding pharmacy. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people haven't even heard of a compounding pharmacy before because they're not all that common. And to be able to get off of, you know, 0.1 milligram or, you know, one milligram either even of, of a medication is not all that common. So um, was it, what, I guess, was it challenging to find a pharmacy to do that? Or or what advice would you give for somebody to be able to take such small um, tapers? I worked with my parents on this pretty extensively. And I think towards the, the beginning and the middle of a taper, it can be possible to just taper the minimal dose that a normal pharmacy will prescribe. And it, it's possible to just taper off taper that dose for me, but especially towards the very end. And like I said, coming off that last one milligram, two milligrams of the benzo, I knew that if I just dropped the last milligram in its entirety and tried to go on, the, the withdrawals were going to be terrible. You know, they're going to be terrible. And I remember even tapering the last couple milligrams going by 0.1. So maybe I did 
0.1 milligrams for five months or four months or whatever it was for those last two. And I think there's something to be said for the psychological effect of having to taper more slowly as you reach the end of the taper. So the first few weeks can be very fast because you're going 50, 49, 48, 47. And before you know it, you're at 45 and 40. And it's very encouraging. But those last two, three of the benzo for me were so difficult and took a long time. I had to be patient. But so I would say that, you know, the compound pharmacy and prescribing the pills of 0.1 increment were crucial for the last few months of the tapers. And that it was also helpful for me to map the trajectory of my taper in a spreadsheet so that I knew roughly where I was going to be at certain weeks. And I knew how much to prescribe or how much to ask for from the compound pharmacy. So whether that was a collection of 0.5 milligram pills and a collection of 0.1 milligram pills that will allow me to take the proper amount for successive weeks. So those were some of the things I did that made it easier. Although this, these, both Zyprexa and the diazepam were not easy. Yeah, it's they a great really, point though. Really, maybe, really in the be- maybe in the beginning, you don't need to work with the compound pharmacy, but as you're getting closer to the smaller doses, that's when it, it's that much more crucial. I, I yeah. appreciate that message. Um, now, what about someone who says like, look, I'm, I can do this with lifestyle. Medications are evil. It's big pharma and it's nobody should need those medications. It can all be done with lifestyle. Um, what kind of advice do you give for some, someone who's approaching it that way? I think for someone who's already taking medications, I know that the effect of coming off medications too quickly can just be really dangerous. It can be really dangerous. So if you're already on meds and unfortunately I have to, I have to offer some advice here, but I, and I was on meds. I think I was kind of stuck. It was like, I'm on meds. There's no way I can really come off of these rapidly without danger to my health and a risk of having a manic episode. So I I just have to come off them slowly. Now, having maybe an undiagnosed permutation of the illness where you're not on meds and then you're starting keto, I can't really speak to that because I haven't done that myself. But what I will say is that, you know, the effects of, in my opinion, the effects of coming off a medication rapidly are, and the risk is far more dangerous than taking it for a few months and just coming off it at a normal pace and, and watching for any psychiatric symptoms that might come up. I I really do believe you just got to bite the bullet and do this a little bit slowly. Cool. I think that's, uh, I think that's great. I think that's perfect. Did Mm. you have, so did you have anything else you wanted to share that we didn't touch on or is that good? Oh, I just, this is so, yeah, I just encourage people to have hope and keep pushing. This is really not an easy thing to do. Getting off some of these meds is a really, really challenging thing to do. Even in my experience, doing keto, doing everything right, when still getting off them is hard work. And um, to getting off a, a medication without you know, and avoiding the symptoms along the way and then coming out healthy and robust is an accomplishment. And it's an accomplishment that a lot of people without a diagnosis or people who've not taken these probably wouldn't understand, but, you know, keep on pushing guys. (laughs) That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I mean, two very detailed and thoughtful approaches to reducing psychiatric medications after being in nutritional ketosis. Can you reduce your psychiatric medications after starting therapeutic nutritional ketosis? Possibly, but please don't do it on your own. Instead, work with your provider, and if they're hesitant, send them this video. Sometimes doctors just need a little push to try something outside of their comfort zone. And for even more helpful resources, Dr. Ede wrote a guide in Psychology Today titled Ketogenic Diets and Psychiatric Medications, and we'll link to that in the description below. So consider printing it out and sharing it with your clinician as well. And remember, 
As Dr. Ede mentioned, all psychiatrists are trained in tapering medications. And if you can approach it with, with the patience and the vigilance like Matt Bazuki does, that could go a long way in helping your provider feel comfortable working with you on, on tapering and adjusting your medications. I would suggest not seeing medication reduction as an automatic guarantee after starting nutritional ketosis, but rather something that you may be able to achieve once you're stable in ketosis and once you put in the effort and have the teamwork. We hope to return to this topic with more perspectives on this channel, so, so stay tuned because this is always an ongoing and very popular topic. And as always, if you found this video helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe so you won't miss any of our future videos. And please leave a comment as we'd love to hear from you and you know what you found most helpful and also what topics you'd like to see videos on in the future. Thank you for watching. We hope this was helpful. Have a wonderful and healthy day. I'm Dr. Brett Sher, and we'll see you here next time at Metabolic Mind.